Okay, I believe it's in the game and we started recording. Um, uh, hi guys, uh, today our third podcast, we have a very special guest for us. Uh, for those who, those of you who don't know, uh, I have Richard Bell with me on the line. Uh, a coach of mine that we work a couple of months, uh, uh, around nine to be honest, he helped me to get uh, probably the best shape in my life, get ready for a photo shoot, and it was a very amazing experience. He also was one of the mentors of the Handsome PT course I graduated, and uh, we worked on several different occasions together, coaching and mentoring, so um, it, it is currently a very exciting moment for us to have him finally <laughs> to meet him and discuss some very interesting things today. Uh, he's the owner and founder of bellcoaching.com. Uh, has uh, been coaching athletes not only in um, uh, uh, from uh, a visual standpoint and uh, day-to-day coaching and mentor, but also powerlifting. He's also um, uh, one of the lecturers in the Handsome uh, PT course and uh, basically one of the experts in the industry. And uh, we are very happy today that we can discuss uh, things about uh, powerlifting, how to get stronger and how to master the three main lifts. So, uh, Richard, do you have anything else to add? Uh, no, I think that's perfect, man. Thank you. Like, I don't, I don't really like to take the spotlight. Um, I think for people listening and watching, like the main, um, the main thing to keep in mind is that I usually just work with like bodybuilding and powerlifting athletes, so pretty high level athletes, and some some fitness professionals like yourself, um, where I just do mentoring. Uh, for anyone watching on YouTube, I'm sorry about the camera angle, by the way. I have a Dell laptop, and apparently someone who engineered that thought it was a great <laughs> idea to just have the POV blowjob angle. So it's a really awkward angle, but I can't do anything about that. Uh, no worries, man. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, That's basically the people that I work with. So um, I think half of my, my personal clientele is uh, is a power lifter and the other half is training to be competitive bodybuilders. So Nice. And so today for, uh, for the first time on our channel, we'll be discussing specifically the three main powerlifting leads. So uh, could you please provide more uh, insights about the specific of those three lifts, specifically the squat bench and the deadlift? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, I think the, um, the first thing that we want to establish is that the power lifts, like power lifting in itself is a very specific sport. So unless you plan on competing in power lifting or unless if you're uh, an actual power lifter, like there's no reason to do the barbell bench press, barbell squat, barbell deadlift, like the conventional ones. That's just, it might be a good tool. Um, but for purposes like bodybuilding and stuff like that or general fitness, it might not be your best tool compared to alternatives. Um, if you do decide to compete in powerlifting, like you got to make do. Like I don't care how you're built, but if you want to be a powerlifter, you need to perform those three lifts, period. Like that's literally the sport. Um, the main thing that we want to keep in mind is that just like any sport on the entire planet, like you're built for a specific sport or you're not built for a specific sport. So me personally, like I'm 175 centimeters. So that's like 5'10", five, 5'11", five, five, for anyone that yep. uses the, uh, the American uh, system. Um, but if I were to have the ambition to compete in the NBA, like I can practice to dunk all my life and spend countless hours on, on trying to, to improve my vertical. Like literally there's always someone from Africa that just is like six foot four has to do this and will always dunk higher than I, I can ever achieve in my lifetime. So um, the same thing with powerlifting. Like if you're not built to squat, bench and deadlift, like you're going to have a bad time and you can definitely improve and you can definitely be a competitive athlete, but just taking a look at what your goal is like I have people coming up to me like okay I want to compete in the European championships or I want to compete at the the world level like okay but like your femurs are literally half of your body like your arms are fucking coming down to your knees (laughs) like (laughs) it's going to be hard like it's not going to be impossible but it's going to be freaking hard to achieve that because you're literally not built to be good at squatting or bench pressing so we got to take those leverages and we got to make sure that we that we optimize the lifts for your individual leverages but we cannot put like uh, a square into a peg hole that's not going to work 
like we need to make sure that we try to make it fit as 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 good as possible basically but we're not going to be able to perform magic so basically anyone and every single athlete ever is going to have uh, a pretty good lift it's going to have they're going to have a decent lift and they're going to have a shitty lift um once you get to the top top level you see some guys who are just built for certain lifts like say bryce lewis for instance like the guy can fucking yeah. squat all day long like he's built for it so well um personally i have an athlete national uh, national champion yeah, in the junior class uh 72 kilo uh, girl women um her femurs are freaking long so she she's in the 72 kilo class she can that lift well over 200 kilos um but just trying to squat like she's doing well but if she loses tension just a little bit it's an instant good morning because she has to literally fall over yeah. all the way to get to, to legal squatting depth so that's going to be way harder on her, her her actual structure so on her knees on her spine and just general strength output power output is going to be lower compared to having shorter femurs and being able to get in that position um, more optimally so you definitely see strength differences there and things like thoracic spine mobility, things like leverages for the upper body that's going to have a huge impact on like where your ball positioning is, like what your distance to the ground is for a deadlift, like how big of an arch you can get. So how how small you can get your range of motion, because a lot of people, I think, mistake powerlifting to be like, who's the strongest athlete? But it's not about who's the strongest athlete. It's about like who's the most efficient athlete with their leverages to move the biggest amount of weight. So you can bench press a fuck ton, but you might not be the strongest bench presser there, if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah. take a look at like 13-year-old Russian powerlifting girls. Like they have an arch, which is literally, I'm pretty sure like, whoever directed the the original exorcist like that's what they had in mind for the positioning in that that bad scene where she freaked the fuck out started screaming and just went full arch mode like that's what you see some of the russian girls doing like they're in an arch and it's literally like this is the bench like it's this and their range of motion is like it's this really, yeah, it's limited. yeah like you unrack it and poop poop done compare that to someone who has to like drop the bar lower the bar like 30 40 centimeters for instance like it's going to be way harder for them to do that so you can you can optimize those specific factors and those components um but you're going to be to a certain extent be limited by your individual structure and that's just something that we need to work on um that being said like powerlifting is about more than just trying to optimize the three big lifts like that's your main goal but you always have to keep in mind that you have a component of uh, morphology and a component of neurology so basically how efficient can you get your nurses nervous system to fire and to uh, operate your leverages within those three lifts but also like how much muscle mass can you gain and can you have to be able to actually have proper force output and having um, the capacity to build that engine basically so i always use the analogy of driving like a, a race car and being the driver like if you put the best driver on the planet in some really shitty car and you have your grandma step into a ferrari and you have like a 100 meter uh, track and it's literally like okay so who's gonna who's gonna win that race like a lot of people would say yeah obviously that's gonna be the best driver i'm like yeah, but he's like limited by the car he's driving. And I don't care how senile your granny is. Like she just has to step on the gas and she's crossed the finish line. So it's not just about like how optimal can you perform the big three and like how optimal is your technique and how much do you optimize your leverages. It's also about, okay, so how big are you for your individual frame? Like if you have two guys, same length, and one of them has five kilos of muscle mass more than the other guy, his potential is going to be a lot bigger. It's obviously potential because it's still about being able to actually um, utilize 
that potential tap into it, utilize the muscle mass to be able to to lift those loads. But you got to combine the two. You got to look at it as like one big um, one big picture to make sure that you become the biggest, uh, most efficient power lifter that you can possibly get. So I think the mistake a lot of power lifters tend to make, and especially the, the guys that just look at the big three, is that they forget about just improving muscle mass and they spend way too little time on actual hypertrophy work. So if I have a guy leg pressing and doing leg extensions and stuff like that, you have people coming up to me like, why the fuck are you having them do leg presses and leg extension? Like, isn't he a power lifter? I'm like, yeah. So he actually needs big quads and he needs strong quads to be able to then utilize that in his squat. And they're like, yeah, but that's not going to make him a better squatter. I'm like, yeah, it is. <laughs> you have a lot more uh, ability to uh, to exert force in your legs because the muscle is bigger. Like, that's if you have proper squatting technique and you're able to utilize that muscle mass well, you're going to have a bigger squat either way. True. And if you have like leakage in the entire system somewhere because there's like a, a muscle mass deficiency in your strength output, your potential, that's going to limit you. Like if we're looking at, okay, so squat morning, the bar up in a squat, for instance, and just your chest position collapses, you move forward. A lot of people are just like, yeah, you need to improve technique. I'm like, sure, but it might just be a quad weakness. You might just have them do more leg presses so they don't actually load their spine, uh, put more stress on their system and just be able to lay down in a leg press and just push weight all day long to make sure that their quads are getting a proper stimulus without taxing the upper back, without taxing the lumbar spine. So that's, I think, something a lot of people tend to forget, that it's not just strength, 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 not just squatting, 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 bench pressing, deadlifting. It's like do your curls, do your chest flies, do your leg extensions, and make sure that they're in there for a specific reason. Like everything in your program should have a very specific reason to be there. And not just from a hypertrophy standpoint, not just from a technical proficiency standpoint, but also a stability standpoint. So if we were to perform dumbbell curls, for instance, like one of the functions of the biceps is to stabilize the shoulder. So if we get into a low bar position and we are limited in our uh, external rotation, our ability to maintain an externally rotated shoulder because that st position is unstable, to improve that, we might not just be able uh, need to work on positioning and mobility. We might just need to work on stability, which if we assume that position in, say, an incline dumbbell curl with an externally rotated shoulder, not at the bicep or elbow, but at the shoulder, and then do our bicep curls, that might lead to improved um, capacity to maintain that position in our low bar back squat. So we're utilizing like isolation work and hypertrophy work. For uh, positions via uh, sufficient mobility, being able to stabilize in that position and having proper stabilization, um, so proper stability thus allowing us to actually exert force optimally. So uh, to quote Jordan Shallow, his whole prescript um, company has that tagline, like mobility, stability, uh, and strength. Mm -hmm. That's literally what we're trying to achieve in the grand scheme of things. Like if you're doing a dumbbell curl just to improve hypertrophy, like that's not gonna aid you in your squat bench and deadlift. But if you do them properly and adjust the technique, because you understand positioning and you understand the necessity for stability, that might actually improve your squat, your bench, your deadlift. So there's a lot to break down there and there's a lot to, to dig in, but understanding the, the, the grand scheme of things and understanding, properly understanding uh, biomechanics is going to make you a lot better as a coach and a lot better as a lifter. And especially at the high level, because for beginners, it's not that it shouldn't be that complicated. Just fucking squat, bench, deadlift, do some hypertrophy work to aid the muscles um, working in those patterns and get strong. 
like make sure your sleep's on point, your stress management is on point, your diet's on point, make sure that you get strong. But once you improve, 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 and you get to like a high level, every single detail is going to matter. Like the difference between winning a championship and coming in fifth might be two and a half kilos. So we will have to optimize everything to make sure that we can get that two and a half kilo gain. And you already uh, touched the point on accessory exercises that they're important for gaining additional mass that will support the main lift. Uh, having that said, what training frequency and volume should be uh, like a general guideline because that's uh, individual for everyone based on their uh, training experience. Like someone will be sufficient with 15 sets, someone with 25 sets per week. So we can't put a cookie cutter program like you do this and you have results. But uh, in my opinion, people who want to do powerlifting or become stronger, usually people who are uh, more experienced in the gym, not like total beginners. So uh, as an estimation or like a guideline, why do you recommend for frequency and, uh, and volume? Um, if we're looking at frequency and volume, like the main guidelines that we see within the research are usually just aimed at hypertrophy work. So I'm pretty sure Jacob talked about this in great length and detail, but uh, anywhere between 10 and 20 sets is the average guideline for most people, but you have people on either side of the spectrum. So you can have people who need less than 10, even high level guys, and you will need people that need more than 20, say people on drugs or great recoverability or whatever the case is. But you have guys on either side of the spectrum, but the average, the mean should be anywhere between 10 and 20 for strength that can actually be lower. Um, but the very specific condition there is it can be lower. That's not saying that it should be lower and that's not saying it should be higher. The main thing, and I think that's one of the biggest mistakes a lot of people make is that we tend to look at averages and research and we tend to say like, okay, if we need between 10 and 20 sets, we'll just take 14, um, throw everything in there on 14. It's like, that's looking at the volume, that's looking at the training aspect, that's looking at the total loading. It's not looking at like, what can you actually recover from? Like, what is your actual recoverability or trainability? Because that's going to decide everything. Like if your sleep shitty, if your stress management is shitty, if your diet quality is shit, if your general lifestyle is absolute thrash, like you're not going to be able to maybe even do 10 sets, let alone 14, let alone 18, let alone 20, because your entire base of support, your system there is complete and utter garbage. So it's not about doing more sets. It's about, okay, so how can we optimize the least amount of work that we should be doing? Make sure that every single set that we do there is optimal. So I'm talking about if you say like um, effective reps, if we're talking about effective reps, if we're talking about like actual hard working sets, and you say 10 sets, I want those 10 sets to be of the highest quality. I don't want someone to say like, okay, I'm doing two sets of leg extensions and the guidelines one set to failure of one rep to failure. So one rep in reserve. I'm like, okay, so failure on a leg extension, is that technical failure? Is that muscular failure? Is that mental failure? If it's muscle failure, like the muscles capacity to actually contract properly and finish the movement that should automatically imply that we shouldn't be able to actually extend our knee anymore. So if you can still bust out reps and you're like, okay, shit, I'm done. Like, no, you're not. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's I'm not counting that set if you don't keep on going, because that's not, if you have 10 sets and one of those 10 sets is a set like that, you need more volume. But that's not because your tolerance requires more volume. It's because the volume you're already running is complete and utter garbage. You're training yeah. like a pussy. So I'm not, I'm not worried about like what should the amount of sets be. I'm like, how well are you performing those sets? Like how many of those reps that you are performing are like actual hard reps, like proper reps, you know? If yeah. we're talking about the whole myo rep system, for instance, it's like the reps that he wants to be doing, like the reps he actually starts counting are effective reps. So how many of the reps that you are performing within a set are effective for the stimulus that we want to uh, pursue and that we want to achieve? So 
So I think that's one of the biggest things that people tend to neglect. And you have guys claiming like, oh, I had an athlete that needed to do 40 sets of quads per week. I'm like, yeah, and I'm pretty sure that guy was a pussy. Because if you're doing 40 hard working sets a week, you're going to be burned to a toast to a crisp within a month. Yeah. Probably less than that. Yeah. So the, the thing that if people look at guys like Mike Menser or anything, just apart from the whole juicing thing, but look at how the guy trained, for instance, and they're talking about, oh, they were doing one set to failure. So I need to do one set to failure because they got results. I'm like, have you seen them train? <laughs> You've seen like the I forgot about his name JP um, trained by JP the guy from uh, from Great Britain. Yeah, I've, 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 I I lost his name, but the guy's an absolute tank and a monster. Like you have people like, oh, he's all for lower volume. Like if you see the guy train, you know why he's about low volume. His yeah. intensity is fucking high. If he's doing four sets a week for a specific muscle group. And you think you need to be doing four sets a week for a specific mu muscle group? Hell no. <laughs> it's the moment where you scream like, I'm done. This is failure. He's like, okay, I can do eight more. <laughs> <laughs> That's helping too. <laughs> yeah. That's like a huge disconnect there. So I think the, um, um, the deeper layer there and the fundamentals is something that a lot of people... Um, either misinterpret it or that they just tend to neglect altogether. But as a general guideline, anywhere between 10 and 20 sets should be your starting point. Uh, the more advanced you are within a specific muscle group, the higher that can be within that guideline. And once we've started with that, so we set the initial program, it's just looking at how well do you recover. So what is your work capacity? So the difference between set one and set four, if you're doing four sets for an exercise, like if the drop-offs, okay, you get 12 reps set one, you get four reps set four, like work capacity is complete and other shit. So you might be better off with having less sets for that specific exercise. And if that's a trend that you see for every individual exercise for that muscle group, that might mean the muscle group needs less sets in total. So if your squat has that pattern, and your leg extension has that pattern, and your split squat has that pattern, then maybe your quads just need less overall volume. If it's just one exercise, it might be a technical issue. It might be uh, an aerobic capacity issue, so just your aerobic system giving out. It might be some component of the muscles working in that specific exercise breaking down. So, for instance, on squats, Maybe your lower back just can't handle it because actual loading throughout the entire week in the program is so damn high that your spine is just like, dude, I need a break. Like, I can't do this anymore because there's 200 kilos on my back and like, I'm done. So that might be a thing. So exercise selection actually matters because if we're squatting on day one, heavy squats on day one, and we want to do um, quads on day two, but day three would be deadlifts. We're not going to do heavy barbell squats on day two if we're going to have like really heavy deadlifts on day three. You might have low intensity squats, you might have split squats, but you could also have leg presses and leg extensions there to still load the muscle, but like uh, make sure that we have the least amount of actual loading in that day two setup so that we are able to maximize actual loading for the deadlift on day three. Uh, but that can also mean like, okay, we still want to train the squat. And um, on day four, we'll do dumbbell split squats. So maybe day two can be lower intensity, tempo, slow tempo uh, squats with a pause at the bottom, beltless, for instance, because the belt's going to decrease intra-abdominal pressure because we're not able to exert extra force into the belt. The tempo is going to decrease overall intensity and the pause is going to uh, decrease overall intensity. So compared to your 1RM heavy belted, no tempo back squat competition style that might just be like 60 or 65 percent of that so it's still training the squat but it's training the squat in a way that it allows for heavier loading in the barbell the next day and that's basically how you want to look at total programming so for power lifters it's just getting strong in the big three is making sure that we realize that the lifts are a skill and the more proficient that we need to be at a skill, 
the better we need to practice it. We need to practice it more often and we need to practice it with quality. We need to practice it well. So if someone's grinding their asses off and they're hitting depth one rep, they're hitting uh, way above parallel the next rep, like that shit quality. So we need to make sure that everything we are doing, we're doing it well, but we need to do it frequent. And that shouldn't just be proper volume, that should be proper frequency. So think about walking. When you were a baby and you couldn't walk, you were crawling. Once you got good at crawling, you could actually try to stand on one foot. You would probably trip. If you were like me, you tripped a lot and you got some <laughs> dents in your head because you tripped against the table and shit like that. But like, you were tripping um, in the physical way, not the mental way. Because obviously that's the whole, oh, you live in the Netherlands, so you must smoke a lot of weed. Like I've never had pot in my life. Like Amsterdam is not that interesting. <laughs> that, that's a news that right there. We need to put that somewhere. <laughs> um, but like at a certain point, you were able to properly stand. Yep. Then you would make sure maybe try to walk. You would fall flat on your face. You would repeat that like 20, 30, 40, 50 times. And then, hey, I can actually walk for two meters. If we're looking at the way we walk now, we're not even aware of what the fuck we're doing because it's an automated system. Yeah, It's ingrained within our nervous system. So it's a pattern that we mastered over time. That's the thing that we want to achieve with the big three lifts. So we want to be efficient. We want to be good at those squat bench deadlift patterns. And we want to make sure it's as automatic as possible, which requires us to practice it often. So if you look at sports like weightlifting, like they might do daily training or two a days, just literally three hours of um, broom work. So just squatting and snatching with a broom, like not even a bar. They might spend two hours with a broom and then an hour with a bar, no weight on there. And then another day they might actually load the bar up. But it's still making sure that they are training the pattern, they're working on that technique, and they're ingraining that pattern into the nervous system without loading it too much. So again, looking at recoverability, and the better that aspect is, the more loading you can apply to that system. So I think what you should be looking at there is the stronger you get, the more we tax the systems. We're very much inclined to look at muscular systems. Maybe some people look at cardiovascular systems, but a lot of people tend to forget that our connective tissue needs proper recovery as well. Because what's one of the big reasons that a lot of people who want to squat bench deadlift with high intensity and high frequency fail over time, like they either get nagging pains, they get injuries, or they just snap their shit, it's because they don't allow the connective tissue to heal well in between sessions, in between weeks. Um, and you see a pattern there, like the stronger you get from beginner to like intermediate to advanced, higher frequency with less volume per session. So if you have 18 sets per week, you might start off with, um, as a beginner, if that's 14, but let's say it's just 18 across the board in that lifespan, just for the sake of simplicity here, you might have two sessions. So a two frequency a week with nine and nine sets. So nine sets, day one, nine sets somewhere, day two. Um, once you get more advanced and you're squatting 200 kilos instead of 20 kilos, it's 18 sets, but it's not just 18 sets where your muscular system needs to make sure that it can tolerate that stress. Your connective tissue is getting 200 kilos smashed on your knees, your hips, your back twice a week, three times a week, four times a week if you increase the frequency. At some point, it's like, okay, your muscles are able to adapt properly because the volume per session is low, but you have a constant nagging pain in your knee, your hip starts aching, your back starts playing up. Those systems are recovering well. So if you look at the highly advanced and elite level, you have guys squatting heavy once a week. Then you have guys on the other side of the spectrum just starting out or like deadlifting 150, for instance, rather than 350, who are saying like, okay, so he's deadlifting 350. So obviously what he's doing should actually work 
because he's deadlifting 350. So I'm going to be deadlifting once a week. That's literally the same thing as a bodybuilder saying, hey, Arnold is training muscle groups once a week and annihilating them. So I should be training them once a week and annihilating them. You're looking at a specific scenario without the context of how the fuck does that guy get there and how the hell does he not break at that level. To get there, you need high frequency, high volume. Once you get there, the main priority is, okay, I need to squat uh, and deadlift in that example heavy once a week. But if I want to train on the other days, I need to allow my body to not break. If I were to do that twice or three times a week, I would literally snap my shit up. So I can't deadlift 350 twice a week. Hell, maybe I can't even that lift anything above 90 percent until i'm anywhere close to competition with a really low volume and high intensity so the stronger you get the better your muscles will be able to recover but your connective tissue takes longer to recover yeah so muscular system anywhere between 24 hours 72 hours for most people um but once you're highly advanced like depending on how you structure your training week and how you set up the exercise selection per day, that might be 24 hours might be enough. But if we're talking about like high intensity loading, connective tissue isn't going to catch up. Connective tissue is going to lag behind. It's going to need more time to recover. So then it should be like, okay, so intermediate squatting four times a week, relative high intensity, uh, maybe a bit of variety here and there and like pause squats and stuff like that and maybe beltless stuff on some days, but relatively high intensity until they literally get too strong for their connective tissue, for their joints to recover properly, then they need to decrease the total training frequency or just make sure that they allow for a greater variety and a greater um, decrease of intensity. So ironically, training volume is going to be an upward trend up to a certain point where you literally are too strong for your structure to sustain that, where you will need to decrease it. And how much you'll need to decrease it totally depends on your recoverability, which uh, depends on your sleep quality and duration, stress management, and then not just like mental stress, but like physical stress, stress from the diet, stress from your lifestyle, um, any physical stress in its entirety. So for instance, if you want to train really high volume on your, your lower body with a high frequency and you're walking 40 K steps a day, like you better start being a lazy, lazy fuck at home because your, your legs are going to be beat the shit up due to that walking. Sure. So you're not going to recover from your strength session because you walk too that much. Um, so that's something you need to take into account. Hey, and uh, you said that connective tissue is uh, likely at some point starting to, to delay recovery rather than the muscle. So um, having that said, in terms of periodization and uh, like different training blocks, do you recommend people like plan them for a certain amount of weeks, let's say five or six or four, and then do a plan deload or just go as they, as they feel and do a, uh, active deload in a given session? Yes, yeah, so there's the whole discussion of reactive deloads versus yeah. predetermined deloads. Um, ironically, if you look at the function that deloads have, it's to make sure that once the training stress has gone up too high, so we actually need something to lower, acutely lower the training stress, then we deload. So training stress has gone up too high, fatigue has built up too much, so we need to lower that. Which, if you do a planned deload, that would mean that you would actually have to force the system, you have to force volume, you have to force intensity to make sure that once we lower overall um, training load and we lower that aspect, that fatigue sets, sets down. So once we get to the whole fitness fatigue model, like we build fitness, but we also build fatigue. Fatigue will drop more than fitness once we get into a deload. Yeah. But if we don't push it hard enough when we deload, it's not going to have the, the proposed effect. It's not going to have the effect that we want 
from that deload because we should be deloading, make sure that we recover, we build more fitness so that we're at a higher baseline after that training cycle. But if we're talking about reactive deloading, that would mean that you have pre pre-planned parameters in place that basically specify like if you don't hit maybe eight reps at a certain uh, intensity, then you're not recovered properly from last session or last week or whatever the hell you want to, to base that on. So you should de decrease the weight and maybe do technique work or you should skip sets or you uh, should do tempo work or whatever it is, but you should be reactive deloading on the spot. So basically the guideline for that lift for that session is this amount of reps for this amount of intensity with whatever pre predetermined guideline that you set. If you manage to achieve that, perfect. Keep on doing what you're doing. If you don't, okay, we need to adjust because based on the programming, you should be recovering properly with the amount of sleep that you're getting, the, the baseline stress that you're um, exposed to and the diet that you're following, that you're eating. So um, that's basically just looking at very specific on the spot decisions. The main in my opinion, issue with the whole discussion between the two is that one of them is very dynamic, like reactive deloading is as dynamic as it gets because it's literally constantly looking at, okay, so did you recover well? If so, load away. If not, okay, let's take a step back so that we can keep on improving afterwards. Whereas pre uh, predetermined deloads basically require you to just constantly push through up to a certain point and then deload. But say for instance, you start off with a training cycle of four weeks and then week five would be an overall deload. And week one, everything's going well. Week two, you break up with your girlfriend, you have a shit week at work, stress is through the roof, you start eating all kinds of crap because you want to get the calories in and it's like, okay, so I either don't eat shit or I just eat whatever the hell I can get my hands on. So um, diet stress is going to be up. Mental stress is going to be up. Like your sleep's going to go down the drain. Everything basically going to hell. So week two, the amount of loading that we do there is based on our starting position where everything was a lot better. So week two is going to be basically overreaching that entire week. Week three, we just keep on loading because obviously after week four, we need to deload. Week four, we still keep on pushing. Even though everything hurts, you feel like absolute shit since week three. And then week five is deloading time. That might work. The main question that you want to ask yourself there is, okay, maybe I should have deloaded just a bit reactively in week two, because obviously that week didn't really, um, didn't really like have the outcome that I wanted because that was way too much in terms of actual loading compared to my recoverability. But let's say that week three and week four are going really well. Week five, there's the, a deload planned. But if you were to try, you could still hit PRs in terms of loading in that week. Like everything's feeling good. Everything's going well. There's no issues. Sleep's awesome. Work capacity is awesome. Everything's perfect. But you still deload. The whole function of the deload and the reason why we implement it should be like, okay, training stress is too high. Fatigue's gone up too high. We need to get that down to make sure our fitness increases properly. But if fatigue's too low, it's not going to have the same outcome. Yeah, true. So that might be an issue. The same thing that reactive deloading might be an issue if you're just a pussy and you can't really tell if it's a technique issue or a mental issue compared to a physical issue. Because if you need to get eight reps and you just you go to the gym and you're like, ah, oh, fuck, I didn't have my coffee this morning and uh, I don't feel like training today. Okay, warming up feels kind of heavy. I filmed it, looks okay, but yeah, mentally I'm not there. Fuck it, I'll deload. Yeah, that's also not, the, not what reactive deloading should be. It's like 
you fucking go all out like you should on your first working set objectively look like okay if i'm not performing well what's the cause okay i slept bad i slept really shitty for the last two days probably i'm under recovered so i'll take that step back but it's not like oh i need to hit eight reps uh, on rep seven i was thinking about my girlfriend that was lying naked on the on the floor this morning yeah didn't get laid because i wanted to go to the gym oh shit we racked away too soon didn't hit eight reps so might as well react the deload no just don't do that because that's abusing the system that's like totally misimplying the system <laughs> True. <laughs> that's not gonna help yeah, the, the people, uh, I think in my, uh, some days that they just try to find a way to abuse a given system, like either plant or reactive load. So they use that as an excuse. Yeah. So it's very important to say to whoever is watching this is that those guidelines are and will work for you if you follow them. Just not try to say, hey, uh, David or Richard said that uh, you need and, and you can get a step back because, like, as you said, I didn't drink my coffee. No. This is like uh, you didn't drink your coffee, but uh, you have slept like a, a two-year-old child. Like for the last month, you recovered well. So just go all in and try to push yourself because you need enough stimulus to, to get that ball rolling. And exactly. using those little excuses will not give you results. True. So, okay, and about uh, types of periodizations, rep ranges, and rest times, what do you recommend? Is there like uh, people should stick to X amount of reps and sets and or should like try to prescribe that based on their one RMs? Um, kind of depends. Like obviously from the whole hypertrophy literature, we know that anywhere between like uh, practically at least anywhere between five and 30 reps taken to uh, a close proximity to failure or maybe even failure if it's a really high rep will build muscle will provide adequate stimulus to get the hypertrophy response so that's going to work but if we look at the specificity aspect of it yep. like a 30 rep squat even if you don't die from that cardiovascularly yeah. but a 30 rep squat isn't going to have that much carryover to your one rm competition squat yeah strength is specific like apart from strength being a skill strength still needs heavy relatively heavy loading so a 15 rm squat might not be your best tool if that focus in that period of time with training is maximum strength like maximizing strength progression um it might be something where you want to see like okay i want to spend a certain amount of time working on my aerobic capacity or working on my breathing capacity in my squats then a 15 rm squat might be ter perfectly fine so it's always looking at like what specific outcome do i want to achieve like what adaptation am i looking for like what am i pursuing and that's going to vary like looking at overall intensity it's a, a specific intensity for a specific exercise like a squat five reps might be a lot better than 10 reps for strength but 5rm leg extensions might be absolute shit compared to 20rm leg extension if your knees can't handle the loading on the five rep uh, leg extensions there so just looking at the, um, I hate to say simpler exercises um, or more like isolated exercises because that's a whole different topic in of itself. But like the more loading you put on one specific joint, the probably the higher reps and the less relative intensity that you want to use compared to multi-joint compound exercises. So it's very different trying to do like a, a, a 3RM on a leg extension compared yeah. to a leg press compared to a squat, for instance. And you're going to feel that. Like if I were to do three reps on a leg extension where rep three would be like a literal, this is failure, I would be really scared to blow my kneecap out. So I would rather just do 20 reps with a slow tempo, really trying to focus on a contraction rather than trying to go really heavy on the leg extension. Whereas if I were to work on my squat and I want my overall strength system to fill, 
10 reps could mean that my back would give out, that my uh, conditioning, my aerobic capacity would give out. So I wouldn't be uh, working towards the capacity, working towards the adaptation that I want to achieve with that exercise. So as a power lifter, you need to keep in mind that in general, and there's very individual um, differences there, but in general, you want to make sure that you train the squat, the bench, and the deadlift relatively frequently with a lower amount of reps with a higher relative amount of intensity. So if you have to choose between 60% and 85% on the squat, it's probably going to be 85%. If you have to choose between 60 and 85% on a leg extension, it's probably going to be 60% on a leg extension. And you can mix and match there because 80% on a beltless three count uh, tempo pause squat is going to be 60% of a 1RM competition squat. So that can be relative. If you try to get like, okay, so the tempo squat is 80%. Yeah, it is for that specific variation, but it's 60% of your normal squad. Yeah. yeah, and the people need to make sure that uh, they're not uh, loading the exercises that will not uh, carry over properly to, to their main list because as you said, with the isolation work, uh, it's basically... Uh, not beneficial in any fashion to try to pull your kneecaps out and the leg extension yeah. because you're trying to get stronger. It's yeah. not making any sense. Yep. Uh, okay, so I believe that uh, we uh, definitely touch base on everything we had on our agenda and I believe that everything we discussed uh, will be very helpful for everyone that will be trying to get stronger and try to uh, improve their uh, performance in the tree lifts and hopefully they get that information helpful and uh, of course guys if you have any comments you can put them uh, in the comment section and uh, we can also relay any information to Richard and try to, to get as much detail as possible to you. Uh, Richard based on what we have discussed is there anything else you want to add? Um, I would also I would always say like just some overall takeaways make sure that you always try to maximize uh, recoverability so always try to maximize sleep stress management diet quality stuff like that because the better that aspect is the more loading you can put on your body worry less about how many sets you should do how many reps you should do but try to worry more about like how qualitative like what the quality of that work is so 10 sets can be very different in someone starting out compared to someone training balls to the walls. That can be very different from someone who always doubts himself in training and that's really scared to push himself compared to someone who's like, okay, I have a bleeding nose, but I can still do five more reps. That's gonna be very different. So don't just look at what other people are doing, but really try to look at, okay, with the volume that I'm already running, am I really maximizing what I'm doing. So if I want to make sure that it's one rep to failure, make sure that that's not two or three or four, because that might compromise the gains you get from that specific program. Um, realize that the three specific lifts and the patterns are a skill. To improve a skill, you need to master it. To master it, you need to practice it often, which also means if you do a lot of empty ball work or low intensity work, you can thus improve of uh, increase your total amount of volume because it's less intensive work the better you get at the specific pattern at the lift and the higher uh, amount of intensity you use the less volume you probably should be using and always keep in mind that bodybuilders and power lifters really aren't that different if we look at like what they should be doing as a base system and that power lifters should definitely try to learn from bodybuilders who can also learn from power lifters, obviously, but that bodybuilding exercises and hypertrophy work definitely has a place within powerlifting. And not just for improving overall muscle mass, but also for trying to improve your base and trying to like improve stability in certain positions where that might be a limiting factor in your lift. Like if you can't keep a low bar position in your squat and thus you like shift up your elbow, you point your elbow up to the ceiling, like at the bottom of the squat and you collapse forward, you fall forward and you miss your lift. That might be a fucking bicep issue. 
because there's not enough shoulder stability there. And that might sound like it's completely crazy and really deep down the rabbit hole, but it, it can definitely be an issue. Um, I couldn't say it better. And uh, just remember, guys, we'll put all contact information, uh, Richard, below in the, the description of the video. You can find him on bell-coaching.com, also Instagram, Facebook, and I believe you have also a YouTube channel where if you would... Uh, 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 yeah, I haven't really done anything with that. We're starting it now because the last, like, six, seven months we've been, like... Yeah work due to the whole COVID, uh, COVID thing. So it's going to be up later this year, but it's probably going to be Dutch only at first. Um, Instagram, like it's pretty much all Dutch, but I get a lot of international people in my DMs. So if you have any questions, obviously feel free to just follow and DM me there. If there's any questions whatsoever or something that you want me to tackle more in depth or like more specific, like always feel free to, to let David know, let me know, and we'll, we'll see what we can do. Yeah. Thank you again for your time today. Hopefully that information will help people who want to get stronger and uh, take care. Thank you for your time. Thank you.